By the way, we should probably turn that on shortly. Uh, I was trying to. See. It is on. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, re perfect. Yeah, the live streaming yeah. and recording is now on. Yeah. Brilliant. Who turned on the live streaming? Did you? Um, no, I didn't. Automatic. I, mean, I think only the host can do it. So I think you must have done it. Or are you not the host? Okay. Anyway, good. Right. Okay. Oh, really? Right, oh, perfect. Yeah, the live streaming and recording is now on. Yeah. Brilliant. Right. Live streaming. Okay, we're also counting down to um, one thirty, so we should slowly kick it off. Um, can do it, so. Welcome, everybody, to today's session, um, which I will be chairing. Um, my name is Gunnar Mella. I'm a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Kent. Recording. I'm one of the co-organizers here uh, for this meeting. Um, so today we again have three speakers, um, so that means we have one hour for talks and 15 minutes for questions and then short breaks as well. Um, and as before, uh, you're all welcome to ask questions uh, during the talks, either by raising your hand or just posting a question in the chat and one of the hosts uh, will then interrupt the speaker for you at an opportune moment. Excellent. So um, without further ado then, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is John Saunders, uh, a professor of low temperature physics at the University of Royal Holloway. Uh, John is best known for his pioneering work on liquid helium in confined geometries. And at Royal Holloway, he has built up the world-class London Low Temperature Laboratory, which provides capability to routinely analyze samples at temperatures well below one millikelvin. Uh, famous for his use of Helium as a, lab a laboratory for low dimensional quantum fluids and solids. Professor Saunders has also worked extensively on topological quantum matter, superconducting quantum devices, and ultra sensitive nanomechanical cryosensors and techniques for cooling two dimensional electron gases, among other things. And his talk today will focus on engineering the superfluid order parameter using nanoscale confinement on the order of the superfluid coherence name. Uh, with that, uh, over to you, John, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I've slightly shifted the, em the emphasis of the talk um, after hearing some of the talks last week, but I hope you don't mind. Um, there are basically three strands or thrusts that we're working on at Royal Holloway. Uh, the first is realizing quantum materials uh, with helium, and here there are two approaches, uh, bottom up or top down as discussed here. Um, we're also working over the last 10 years on cooling electronic quantum materials to below one millikelvin. And the main focus of the current work is studies of unconventional superconductivity in iterbium rhodium 2 silicon 2. And I'll say just a little bit about that towards the end of the talk. Um, and we've further done work on cooling uh, two dimensional electron gases uh, below one millikelvin because that's of great interest for the fractional quantum Hall effect, as we all know that's an interesting uh, topological material. Um, and the third strand, uh, which we're just beginning, is uh, looking at quantum technology at the ultra low temperature frontier, and I won't say anything about, uh, about that today. Um, so uh, there are many um, uh, theorists in the audience. So here's a picture of some uh, cryostats. Uh, the technique for cooling to below one millikelvin is the nuclear adiabatic demagnetization of, uh, of, uh, of copper. And here we have one, two, three, four uh, such, uh, such cryostats, each of which is focused on a different class of problems. And together, these form part of the European microcalvin platform and uh, are an access facility of that. Um, so let me just uh, publicize this entity. So this was, um, has been funded for uh, a year or so now. Um, it's uh, funded by Horizon 2020 as an advanced infrastructure. You can see here in uh, orange the um, access facilities. So EMP provides transnational access to uh, platforms which are complementary at these different institutions uh, li li listed here. And we are one of, the, one of these. So this is an interesting way of taking the study of quantum materials to uh, still lower temperatures and addressing the technolo 
technical challenges that are necessary to do that and to do measurements on these different different systems. Um, so I was uh, taken by uh, the end of Hideo Takaki's talk, uh, where um, he uh, quoted his inspiration from Zen, uh, which was, if I remember correctly, uh, to go to a state of nothingness and see the hidden reality. Um, so we aren't quite going to a state of nothingness, but we are going to be studying something that's extremely simple, and that's helium. Uh, and the question is, uh, what interesting uh, new realities, quantum realities, emerge from such an extremely uh, simple system? So this is totally at the other end of the spectrum from Hide's talk, uh, where a lot of the complexity uh, arose from the fact that the materials were ones in which there were several competing energy scales of the same order of, 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 of magnitude. Um, so as you know, we have uh, two isotopes, one's a fermion and one's a boson. And what we're gonna do is to manipulate those and study them in 2D and quasi 2D uh, and see if we can uh, model um, uh, different quantum materials that you theorists are interested in. Um, so the, the, the track record of, uh, of helium is, is, as you know, uh, pretty strong. Um, so, um, I can get the laser pointer working. Um, the first bosonic superfluid uh, demonstration of um, uh, defect mediated uh, phase transitions, the KT transition in two dimensional helium four, uh, the paradigm system that was important to Landau for establishing the standard model for interacting Fermi liquids, and of course, the first uh, unconventional um, superconductor, as it were. Um, and uh, now recognized really as uh, the only Fermi established uh, topological uh, superconductor, I would say. And we have two phases, one chiral and one with time reversal invariant uh, phase. Um, so um, the, the, um, whoops, it is, uh, um, the uh, bottom up approach, uh, discussed earlier is to um, grow atomically layered uh, films um, on the uh, surface of, uh, of graphite. Um, and uh, with these systems, uh, uh, these are the uh, phenomena that we can study. So you can see, uh, I'm not gonna read the list, but there's a huge, uh, uh, there's a huge variety. And uh, to illustrate how this works, I'm going to just focus on the first three items in, 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 this, in this list. Um, there's an overview that we recently published in, in this journal, and this is the list of all the people that have contributed to this work over the years that we've been uh, doing it. So where does this flexibility of atomically layered uh, helium come from? So here's the, uh, the graphite substrate. And the, the first layer is uh, highly compressed to solid. And then uh, the subsequent layers grow atomic layer by atomic layer because the surface of graphite is uh, a, a atomically flat. And we can add up to eight, uh, if we like, uh, he helium layers. Um, so here the substrate, the effective substrate then is the graphite plus the, the, the first solid layer. Um, now what we can do to uh, modify the graphite surface is to pre-plate it. Um, so before adding our helium-3 sample, let's say, uh, we could grow a solid model layer of, uh, of helium-4, a bilayer of helium-4, uh, a solid bilayer of helium-4 with a superfluid helium-4 film, or we could create solid hydrogen layers. And every time we pre-plate the graphite surface in this way, that gives us a, a new composite substrate and the helium film of interest, then we grow atomic layer by atomic layer on that. So these different composite substrates allow us to uh, use helium, the helium film to model different physics. In other words, different physics emerges uh, depending on what pre-plating um, that we've used. And most of this was discovered by accident and by trial and error as we just pursued these experiments. Um, so let's take an example. Um, a fundamental question uh, that arose uh, shortly after the discovery of high TC and was posed by uh, Anderson in, in this famous paper 
uh, was does the Landau Fermi liquid survive in, in, in two dimensions? So it would be of interest then to uh, create uh, an ideal two dimensional Fermi system. Um, and what we really want uh, is to have one in which we can vary the density of the, uh, of the two dimensional fermions without other phase transitions, like for example, uh, solidification via a Wigner Mott transition. So it turns out we can do that if we take the graphite surface, we pre-plate it with uh, four layers of helium-4. The first two layers form solid, and the subsequent two layers form a sieve fluid. And then we add helium-3 uh, to that surface, and we can continuously vary the density of that, uh, of that, uh, that helium-3. Um, and as we, do, as we do that, uh, the, the, the uh, system goes from a Fermi gas to a more strongly interacting uh, fer Fermi, uh, Fermi system. Um, now, the advantage of this system is that there's a negligible uh, spin orbit coupling that just comes from the dipole dipole interaction. Uh, the interactions between these fermions are strictly, uh, strictly two dimension. Um, the, the delocalization of the helium-3 uh, wave function perpendicular to the surface is small compared with any uh, characteristic scattering length. That means that the interactions here are two-dimensional interactions. This situation doesn't apply uh, in cold atoms experiments where uh, attempts are made to simulate uh, two-dimensional interacting uh, fermion system. And uh, we're looking at a single two-dimensional helium-3 layer. Uh, so there's no uh, interlayer coupling such you would get in a quasi uh, two-dimensional uh, material. Um, so now, why is the helium-3 two-dimensional? Well, it's built, if we ask the question, uh, what's the wave function of, uh, of a single helium-3 atom uh, on this uh, sur surface potential? Then you see here, this is the ground state wave function. You see it's a nodeless, and this is the first excited state wave function with a, with, with a single node. And these states were first characterized by Andreev um, to explain actually the influence of helium-3 on the surface tension of uh, the bulk liquid helium-4. And he demonstrated that helium-3 was preferentially bound to the surface and as such influenced the, um, the, surface, the, surface, the surface tension. Um, so this is the ground state. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a two-dimensional Fermi system on that, on that ground state. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure um, the Pauli susceptibility of this uh, two-dimensional system. Um, and we're going to measure the heat capacity. And as you know, uh, the heat capacity is, uh, gi gives us a measure of the effective mass. And the uh, enhancement of the Pauli susceptibility over the uh, 2D uh, Fermi gas value uh, tells us uh, the combination of the effective mass and the Landau parameter F not A. The effective mass is determined by uh, the hydrodynamic mass uh, and the Landau parameter F1S. The hydrodynamic mass is, uh, is what's referred to in electronic systems, the dynamic mass. Um, so it's the enhancement of the, uh, equivalent to the enhancement of the electron mass uh, that arises from its coupling to uh, bosonic modes like phonons within, uh, within the crystal. In our case, it's about the coupling between the helium-3 and the underlying uh, um, superfluid helium-4 film. Uh, so it's coupling between this fermion and the uh, bosonic uh, excitations of the, of the helium-4 uh, helium film. Um, and uh, under the right conditions, then we can write the global effective mass as, as, the, as the product of these two things. But there will be conditions under which this breaks down uh, that have been discussed in this interesting and very poorly cited paper. Um, so if, for example, the, um, the, the, the Fermi velocity becomes comparable uh, to the speed of sound or Riplon modes within, within this film, um, then there'll be some analogous, uh, an analog of the, of, of the Cherenkov effect, and you'll have strong coupling between the fermions and, uh, and the bosons, and this condition will actually break down. This separability, <coughs> excuse me, will break down. But we're not currently in that, in, in that regime. 
Um, so what you see from this is that we can, uh, by measuring uh, susceptibility and heat capacity, uh, we can separate out uh, the, effect, the, the effective mass and hence determine F1S and determine F0A. So that data is, is shown here. Um, the effective mass from the heat capacity then uh, has this uh, density dependence, dependence on two-dimensional density. And uh, in, the, in the limit of low densities, then we get the hydrodynamic mass. And so uh, this slope here tells us the density dependence of F1S. And we can unambiguously determine what F0A is. And here is the data for that. Now, what this tells us immediately is that um, the result is inconsistent with Fermi gas theory. Um, uh, bit because the F1S goes as the second order of the Fermi gas parameter and F0A goes as, uh, as first order of the Fermi gas parameter. Um, so the analysis that, that we, we then do is uh, to apply Hartree-Fock theory in, in two dimensions uh, following uh, th th this work here. Um, and so um, the Landau parameters are determined in terms of the uh, expansion of the um, interaction potential around the, uh, around the Fermi surface. Um, so the bottom line of this is that uh, we can determine uh, from our data uh, the form of uh, that interaction potential. And uh, what we find is that because F0A and F1S are more or less of the same order of magnitude, but just opposite sign, um, uh, this parameter here is small. Uh, the interaction is dominated by this quadratic term. We can show that this quartic term is, uh, is negligible. Uh, so the upshot then is, is that the interaction in momentum space is highly anisotropic. <clears throat> um, and so the question for the theorists in the audience then is uh, what, uh, why are large momentum transfers dominant? Uh, what is the uh, physical interpretation of this high degree of anisotropy? Uh, should we go beyond Hartree-Fock theory? How do we do that? And what's the physical um, understanding of the result that we have here? So let's contrast that with um, a different system in which we see a Mott Hubbard transition. So now we have the graphite substrate. Uh, we have a pre plating layer, which is just going to be, in our case, uh, either a monolayer of solid helium 4, which is non magnetic, which is convenient, or a bilayer of HD. And we can study the properties of a helium 3 uh, monolayer on that, uh, both of those composite substrates. So by measuring the heat capacity, uh, we determine the effective mass. And as the function of density of this layer, this shows uh, divergence. And that divergence is indicative of uh, uh, a Mott Hubbard uh, transition, a bigner Mott Hubbard uh, trans transition. Uh, the behavior is consistent with the almost localized fermion model, because if we measure um, the magnetic susceptibility, uh, that diverges in pretty much the same way. Uh, and that's because in this, in this model, F0A is very weakly uh, dependent on, on, uh, on, on density, whereas the effective mass, as you see, is extremely, yes. A question, uh, how do you arrange that uh, you previously had a superfluid layer of helium-4, a double layer, and now you have a monolayer of solid helium-4? What are the conditions that enable you to go between those different pre-platings? Okay, well, those are different experimental runs. Uh, we start off with the graphite, uh, we call the graphite surface down, and then we add helium-4 atoms. And uh, depending on how many helium-4 atoms we add, we can either have uh, a single helium-4 monolayer or the four-layer film that we've just been referring to. So we can simply adjust by hand, by metering in the amount of helium-4 gas, how thick the, uh, the helium-4 pre-plating layer is. And, and, you can, and you can determine that the layers are superfluid or solid from torque magnetometry. Is that how you do it? Um, so the superfluidity of the, of the four-layer film was determined in a separate torsional oscillator experiment, which I haven't described here, which we did. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, 
so what we have then is we have a transition here between the two-dimensional Fermi liquid and, uh, and uh, a, mod, a mod insulator. And the argument that we want to make is this mod, mod insulator is the candidate for a quantum spin liquid. Um, so let's look at that. Why should this system be such a candidate? Well, we have uh, the, the two-dimensional helium-3 on a, on a, sits on a triangular lattice, so it's frustrated by geometry. Um, the exchange mechanisms are competing atomic ring exchanges. So this is the Hamiltonian that was first written down by Thalys many, many years ago. Uh, in terms of the permutation operators. So you can have two particle ring exchange, uh, three particle ring exchange, four particle ring exchange, six particle ring exchange. The permutation op uh, operators are, are, are those written here. And so what you have is you have a, a competition between two and three particle exchange, which are effective Heis effectively Heisenberg. J2 is antiferromagnetic, J3 is ferromagnetic, it's easier to exchange three particles than two, so this is net uh, ferromagnetic, and that's frustrated by uh, by force being exchanged. So we have two sources for frustration for magnetic, for magnetic frustration. Uh, so not only uh, do we have a highly magnetically frustrated system, but we have system uh, a system that's on the border of uh, a metal insulator transition, which is one of the criteria that Sentinel uh, posited for. Um, as being uh, favorable to the formation of a, 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 of a spin liquid. Uh, and what we find as we, uh, as we uh, make this transition between uh, the two-dimensional Fermi liquid and, uh, and the mod insulator is that it's not described as a conventional two-phase coexistence. You see that the solid fraction uh, on a logarithmic scale varies linearly with density. If this was classical two-phase coexistence, this would vary on a linear scale uh, with, uh, with, with density. And we also find that we can extract uh, the effective mass of the, of, of the fluid component, and that shows this divergence at the, uh, at the um, at a critical point, uh, at a critical point here. Um, so, um, uh, now, if we measure the uh, magnetization or susceptibility at, at low temperatures and look at its temperature dependence, what we see uh, is a, a temperature dependence that's characteristic of, 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 a Fermi, of a Fermi liquid. So what Sentil told us earlier in the week, or last week, uh, is that for a, um, a gapless spin liquid where we have uh, a spin-on Fermi surface, um, the susceptibility is Pauli-like, and the heat capacity has its anomalous temperature dependence due to the emergent, emergent gauge field. So, so far we've been unable to measure this, but we measured this. Um, so now rather than just looking at the uh, temperature independent Pauli value, we look at how that uh, decreases as a function of temperature, uh, moving up in, up in temperature, and it's given by, by this form. And this is the characteristic form of the um, susceptibility of a uh, Fermi, Fermi system, first posited by Dugayev. Uh, it interpolates between, as you can see, between Pauli and Curie, and the effective degeneracy temperature is given by this parameter here. Um, so from this temperature dependence, we can infer um, um, uh, uh, the degeneracy temperature of 200 microkelvin. And so the proposition is that, is that we can um, uh, use that to characterize the energy of the spin-on Fermi surface, if this is indeed a, a gapless quantum, quantum spin liquid. Um, now, if we go to a, 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 different, a, a different regime, um, if we add a, a subsequent helium-3 layer, uh, so an overlayer of helium-3, then that and an additional RKKY exchange channel, and we have a model two-dimensional ferromagnet. Uh, and, and basically what this analysis is showing us is that the, uh, the temperature dependence of the magnetization of, of that is described by um, spin wave theory in, in two dimensions. It's consistent with the Mermin-Wagner theorem. There's a small gap that's determined by the, by the Zeeman, Zeeman field. Um, so spin waves are the excitations when the ground state is ferromagnetic. <clears throat> so 
But going back to the case in point, then uh, what we have is we have this um, um, Fermi liquid like tem temperature, temperature dependence, as I just um, explained. Um, so now, if we ask the question, is there any way that we can describe that temperature dependence by um, uh, bosonic spin wave excitations? Uh, our understanding from this work is that the answer to that question is, is no. You'd have to have uh, an unphysical um, value for the exponent of, uh, of this term in the, uh, in, in the energy of, of, of the spin waves. Um, and so um, it, given that then, uh, and given the fact that the temperature dependence of the magnetization is naturally explained by this Fermi uh, gas form, uh, that then um, it seems that indeed the temperature dependence is, is described by fermionic excitations rather than spin wave excitations. All of which uh, says that indeed um, <clears throat> we may have a, a, a gapless quantum spin liquid. So then the question here, I wanted to use this opportunity then to throw out uh, the, the, the following question um, to the theorists uh, uh, present. How could we really uh, prove prove that. Um, so as I understood it um, from Sentel's talk, um, the spin-ons, <clears throat> these neutral fermionic excitations, naturally come with this emergent gauge field. Uh, that gauge field uh, gives this very interesting temperature dependence of the, uh, of the heat capacity. And it will be very nice to know uh, or see the derivation of that. I've seen this result in uh, a paper in 2005 by Matrunic, but I haven't actually come across a full derivation of this interesting temperature dependence. So if anyone can point me in that direction, that would be great. Question? Yeah. Uh, obviously, by the very nature, um, helium atoms are neutral, um, but you don't mean that. So my question to you is, how would you rule out the possibility this, this isn't just a Fermi liquid, John? I'm not hearing you. John, you're muted. John, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, can you say that again? Because we somehow lost you. Yeah, okay. Um, so we have a transition. Um, this state has emerged uh, in a transition from uh, a two-dimensional Fermi liquid into a mod insulator. The high temperature dependent uh, um, the, uh, behavior of the susceptibility is curie weiss law. So, we'll, so what we're looking at then is the, is the um, is starting at t equals zero. Start, so at high temperatures, it's curie weiss law, which mm -hmm. is indicative of, uh, of, of a system of localized um, helium-3 atoms in a triangular lattice uh, structure. Now we go to t equals zero, uh, we have uh, a temperature independent susceptibility, and we're looking at the uh, decrease of that susceptibility as we go up in temperature, which has this characteristic Fermi liquid form. But, but how do you tell that there's no conduct, an analog of conductivity? How do you prove it localized despite, and not just a Fermi liquid, a delocalized Fermi? Okay, so we, uh, as I said, we've had, we, we've had a transition from a 2D Fermi liquid into something that we believe to be a, a mock insulator through a mass diverging transition. Mm -hmm. um, so um, those are the grounds on which we behave, uh, in which we believe that we have a, a localized uh, Fermi system. Now you're asking the question, have we done other tests uh, to demonstrate that that state is, uh, is localized beyond that? And the answer is no, we have not. Mm. Um, so, um, so with this uh, then uh, high, high hypothesis of, uh, of, the of the nature of this state, um, what other properties of that state could we measure in order to um, demonstrate uh, this uh, um, quantum spin liquid behavior? It has an exotic uh, um, temperature dependence of the of the um, of the uh, susceptibility with this very low uh, Fermi degeneracy temperature. Uh, 
the capacity will be of this uh, of this form. We can measure the uh, thermal conductivity. Interestingly, uh, we are, we could ask the question: What would the spin dynamics and correlations in this quantum spin liquid state be? And my question is: Is there a, a theory of that? Because we have a powerful system, where we can do NMR on the spin one half, spin on excitations. That means we can measure relaxation times and, in principle, the spin diffusion uh, coefficient, so long as we keep the Zeeman energy less than the spin on Fermi surface uh, energy. So the question is, um, given that we have this highly entangled uh, state of, uh, uh, of spin-ons, what are the spin dynamics and correlations in that, in, in that new phase? We have a question from the chat, John, um, from Marie Hoops, and she asks, could there be a divergent mass without localization? Um, I don't believe so. I believe that, that the, uh, the divergence of the effective mass, which has been actually observed quite clearly in, in, in this system, um, and I don't think there are many other systems where um, such a mass divergence has been um, so unambiguously observed, um, is taken to be clear evidence of um, a um, transition from a Fermi liquid into a localized state. So I don't believe so. And here's another one from Yasha Komijani. Uh, I understood from Central's talk that C over T is constant. In your case, C over T seems to be diverging at low temperature. Are you not at a critical point? Well, um, I don't, uh, so I think uh, that was not my understanding from Central's talk or the Maturnich paper. Um, my understanding is, is that, um, so you have a spin on Fermi surface, but you have this anomalous power law dependence of the heat capacity. And uh, this anomaly then arises from the emergent uh, gauge field. Um, but as I said a minute ago, I've yet to see um, a, a full derivation of that, or find, I should say, uh, a full derivation of that, of that interesting interesting result. But it's quoted by the Matrunich 2005 paper. Thank you. Um, and um, the other point, as we know about the quantum spin liquid state, is that uh, a feature of it is that it has a long range, uh, it's a highly quantum entangled state. Um, so the implication of that would be that if we were able to do some non-local measurement on this system, uh, somehow or other, we could uh, directly probe the quantum entanglement. Um, and uh, one uh, way that we're, th we're thinking for actually other purposes, we're developing microcoils for local NMR. So the question is whether by doing um, local excitation and detection of NMR-like signals, one would uh, be able to get some insight into the extent to which um, the, the system supports quantum entanglement. Uh, and, and maybe this is a, a sort of a more general question. To what, it, to what extent is the, are, are there uh, demonstrations of, uh, of quantum entanglement in uh, condensed uh, matter systems? Actually, John, I have a question. Yeah. So you say that you want to de um, develop these local measurements with NMR, but is the idea that you could um, use them to kind of measure correlations at different places at the same time, or in which way is this going to help you to address something that's actually non-local property of the system? So um, that is not uh, fully uh, fully worked out. Um, it, so the short answer is I, d I don't know. Um, it is of interest. Um, to ask the question, could you have a, a, a very small but high inductance uh, coil? So it's so, so over a rather small region of space. Uh, we're talking about 100 microns, maybe some tens of microns. You could observe the NMR signal from that region. Uh -huh. um, so now the question is, if you uh, make an excitation at some highly remote uh, point in, in, in the system, could you detect a response in your uh, uh, mi microcore? And what would be um, the characteristic uh, um, velocity um, 
at which that response occurred? And could you exceed whatever it was the local uh, speed of uh, speed of light? Um, so I see the speed of light in such a system would be uh, well if it was a if it was a system with uh, w w characterized by spin waves, it would be the spin wave velocity. I don't know what it would be in a in, in a in a spin on system. But to the extent that you could come up with a characteristic speed of light uh, and you're asking the question, can I get a, um, an excitation response that, uh, 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 that exceeds that uh, rate of propagation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I... I mean, on. it's, uh, um, this is condensed matter in the city, so um, I'm, uh, apart from the fact that I'm recorded, which is a shame, uh, I'm, you know, these are some crazy ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I understand that. Uh, so the combination of uh, kind of local excitation, then another local measurement that gives you some something non-local that you can then yeah, deduce. But item three here is actually uh, some sort of fairly basic um, information on a, on, 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 a spin, on a spin system. And I'm not sure whether um, um, that has been theoretically calculated uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a marker for how um, a, a spin liquid would be different from a two-dimensional system whose excitation was spin waves. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. I haven't found um, that theoretical work. Yeah, it's certainly not easy to do, but I think it's a popular question. So if it's not been okay. answered yet, I'd be confident that somebody will within short <clears throat> delay. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the um, um, uh, top-down uh, uh, approach. Um, this was the main thing that was advertised um, for this for this talk. Uh, but I hope you don't mind uh, that I was somewhat inspired by the two talks by Central to devote a little bit of uh, time on this uh, quantum spin liquid um, issue. Um, so um, this is the idea. Um, um, so here we have the phase diagram of superfluid helium three. Uh, this is the pressure and temperature axis. Uh, so we have two main phases then, uh, the B phase and the A phase, which I'll discuss shortly. Uh, and the question is, uh, what happens when you subject this to uh, confinement? So what defines the length scale of confinement? It's the, it's the coherence length, uh, which you can think of as the, uh, the size of the, of the Cooper pair. Uh, and that's determined by these parameters, the Fermi velocity, which is pressure dependent, and Tc, which you see here, is also uh, uh, pressure, pressure dependent. Um, so the coherence length can be tuned uh, by, by pressure, and the liquid can be put inside this, in this cavity of, of, of fixed height. So the effective confinement is actually going to be the ratio of these two length scales. Um, so the effective confinement then can be tuned by pressure, which is uh, rather um, convenient. Okay, so these two, these two main phases then. Um, so here's the order parameter of the A phase. Um, I'm indebted to Lev Levitin who uh, came up with these uh, beautiful uh, pictograms of the, uh, of the order parameter of these various phases. So the A phase is, is chiral, it's an equal spin pairing state. So there are just two components. Um, I didn't say, but the pairs form in the state of orbital angular momentum one. So it's a P wave superfluid. Um, in the A phase, you just have two components of the spin triplet. So, so you have up-up pairs and down-down pairs. And they both form with their orbital angular momentum in the same direction. So this phase is chiral and it breaks time reversal symmetry. The other main phase is the B phase. <clears throat> As you can see, that has all three components of the spin triplet, <clears throat> um, but the state breaks spin orbit relative symmetry. So you see that each of these pairs is forming in the state of total angular momentum zero. Lz equals minus one goes with Sz is equal to plus one. So this uh, effectively this is a strongly spin orbit coupled um, superfluid, uh, superfluid state. <clears throat> uh, now what's the role of confinement? 
uh, when you can find something, well, there are walls present. And the question then is, how do these various components of the order parameter uh, um, deal with the presence of that wall? Um, so if you have a, a wall that is specularly scattering, and I'll describe uh, what, what I mean by specular and diffuse scattering in more detail in a moment, then as long as you orient the orbital angular momentum perpendicular to the wall, there is no suppression of the L sub Z equals plus and one uh, minus one com component. Um, the L sub Z equals zero component is always suppressed uh, to zero. So you can see that in the A phase, there is no uh, L sub Z equals zero com component. So you can see already that for specular scattering, we're going to be able to have an order parameter that is completely unsuppressed even in confinement. But the, um, the, the, the B phase has such an L sub Z equals zero component. And so this is going to be more strongly suppressed uh, than these two components under all uh, scattering, scattering conditions. So in other words, uh, these two order parameters respond differently to being confined to the presence of these walls. The other uh, neat thing about the presence of walls is uh, um, as we have two topological uh, superfluids of distinct, uh, distinct character, as we know from <clears throat> um, works on topological quantum matter, uh, the, the, the key idea is of uh, bulk surface correspondence and that necessarily surface excitations arise uh, the nature of which is determined by the topology of the parent uh, bulk, uh, bulk phase. <clears throat> so in the B phase, uh, these surface excitations are Majorina fermions, which are linearly dispersing. Um, so this shows the uh, dispersion relation and the density of states uh, for subgap excitations in, in, the, uh, in the B phase. And in the, in the A phase, uh, the excitations are of, uh, of different character. Um, so um, here we're confining, here's the A phase, here's the B phase, we're confining them in, in, in this way. Um, and this is the suppression of the uh, uh, components of the gap for the A phase and, uh, and the B phase. So you see for, um, uh, the A phase with specular boundary conditions, we, uh, we, we have um, uh, no gap suppression. And for diffuse uh, scattering conditions, then uh, this is the gap, the gap suppression. And for the B phase, uh, this component of the gap is always uh, suppressed, no matter what the surface scattering uh, conditions are. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, um, the confinement is over a fi fi length, fixed length scale, but we can tune the coherence length as a function of pressure. And these are the, uh, the, the range of tuning from 80 nanometers at zero pressure to about 20 nanometers at the melting point. <clears throat> um, so in the following then, um, this is what we've discovered. Um, not surprisingly, what I've just said, uh, the confinement uh, is going to have a huge effect on the relative stability of the A phase and, and the B phase. And we're going to find that the A phase survives under strong confinement, so long as we can create specular scattering conditions. <clears throat> um, we also find that there are new phases. So the A and B, B phases were those that were present in bulk liquid. Uh, but new phases emerge under confinement, including uh, uh, a periodic uh, density wave, uh, so a spatially modulated um, superfluid that was actually predicted, uh, but the stru structure and topology of this PDW is different from what the prediction is, and we can discuss what the um, origin of that might, might be. <clears throat> um, so uh, once we've established these things, um, the theorists have, have done more work to show that uh, by structuring the confinement, we can engineer even more phases. And then that allows us to create hybrid uh, nanostructures that I'll talk about towards, towards the end. But one I wanna clarify uh, now um, 
is um, how um, uh, uh, we can tune in situ the, the surface scattering and how some unexpected uh, observations uh, uh, arose out of that. So let me get on before, without further ado, uh, to the surface scattering. <clears throat> um, so we have a, a, a parameter which we're going to call the specularity, which is introduced into quasi-classical theory, as, uh, which is the theory for determining order parameter suppression and the spectrum of surface excitations as a phenomenological uh, par parameter. And uh, we can vary that from um, um, no non-pair breaking uh, um, case, specularity. So uh, this is a quasi-particle trajectory. For all quasi-particle trajectories coming into the, to, to the surface then, uh, they bounce off the surface in a specular, in a specular fashion. Uh, the opposite of that is uh, retro reflection, which is um, maximally uh, pair breaking. And uh, in the middle, we have uh, diffuse or random scattering. So for the quasi particle scattering uh, trajectory coming in, right? So uh, then there's a random possibility of which direction uh, the emerging quasi particle comes, comes out on. <clears throat> um, and the point I'm going to make in a minute is that we can vary uh, these scattering conditions in, in situ. Uh, so for specular scattering, because there's no gap suppression of these components of the order parameter, uh, both gap suppression and surface and dry bound states are eliminated for the A phase. <clears throat> um, so you can see this is a, like a simple way of visualizing that then that the energy of uh, the subgap surface bound excitations is given by um, the uh, phase change experienced by the uh, of the order parameter experienced by the quasi particle between its incoming and outgoing uh, trajectory <clears throat> um, so for the um, 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 uh, a, uh, for the A phase, and this is the order parameter of the, uh, of the A phase, um, for specular scattering, there is no change in the component of the momentum in the, in the plane. So there is no phase change. So there are no excitations below uh, the, uh, the, the energy gap. So that if you have specular boundary conditions, then uh, that eliminates uh, um, all surface excitations and also eliminates uh, the suppression of TC and of the gap. Uh, for diffuse scattering conditions, then all components of the order parameter are suppressed. And for retro reflection, you can see from this relation here that, uh, that all of the um, uh, scattering events are going to lead to uh, zero energy bound states. So there's a pile up of zero energy Andrea bound states, and that maximizes the uh, um, TC suppression and gap suppression. <clears throat> so we can tune um, this um, uh, um, specularity uh, in situ uh, by uh, adjusting the surface boundary layer. <clears throat> um, so what we find is the follows, as follows, that if we have a, a solid helium-4 layer, um, then um, uh, the scattering is essentially uh, diffuse. And if we have a, a, a superfluid helium-4 layer, um, then the scattering is specular. So we can tune between these two. And we do that by um, pre-plating, uh, going back to the notion of pre-plating that came up for the atomically uh, layered films on the surface of graphite, uh, by pre-plating the surface with helium-4. If we don't do any pre-plating, uh, then because of the strong van der Waals potential between the helium-3 and the surface, the first few layers of, he of helium-3 next to the surface will be solid. So we'll have magnetic solid uh, he helium-3. Um, and what we find then is that uh, this gives us uh, some rather unexpected um, uh, um, e e effects, uh, which I'll come on to uh, later. But the main idea I want to get across is that the, the scattering is tunable in, in, in situ. So for a given cavity, for a given sample, we have a, to adjust the temperature of the sample in order to do this pre-plating action. 
but we can come back and look at different uh, surface scattering uh, conditions. Um, so uh, this shows the fact that the phase diagram is profoundly affected by uh, con con confinement. And you can see as we go progressively from bulk to a one micron cavity to a 0.7 micron cavity to uh, a 0.2 micron cavity, uh, that the region of the stability of the, of the B phase is, uh, is shrunk so that over this uh, range of pressure and temperature, we see no B phase in the case of the thinnest ca cavity. Um, <clears throat> so now what we want to do is we want to do uh, some uh, precise measurements on, the, uh, on a 200 uh, nanometer cavity uh, in order to uh, demonstrate this tunability of the, uh, of the surface scattering uh, conditions. Um, so what you see here on the right hand side is uh, uh, we, we're doing NMR on the helium-3 and the NMR frequency shift is the signature of the superfluid transition. Um, so here's the uh, signature from the cavity and there's its TC and we have some regions here of, uh, of effectively bulk liquid, which we use as markers, so as we can precisely determine the uh, TC of bulk liquid. And so these are the signatures from bulk liquid, and you see that there's no TC suppression. <clears throat> if on the other hand, we have a boundary layer of solid helium-4, then here is the transition in the far end uh, bulk marker, and here is the transition um, in the uh, in in the cavity which is which is suppressed and this is the behavior when we have a solid helium three boundary layer that i'll come on to momentarily um, so now in the pressure uh, temperature plane um, uh, this is the results for uh, a specular scattering surface and this is the result for a uh, diffusely scattering surface. So what you can see is that there's no TC suppression for a specular surface, and there's a pressure dependent um, TC suppression uh, for the diffuse, the diffuse surface. <clears throat> um, since the pressure is encoded in the coherence length, we can uh, plot that same data in, in this way. So what we're doing is uh, here, is we're tuning uh, the confinement, the coherence length by pressure, and replotting this data. So as we increase uh, the, um, the, the, the degree of confinement uh, by increasing the um, um, coherence length, uh, by going to lower pressures, then we see progressively stronger and stronger TC suppression for diffuse scattering, whereas for specular scattering, we see essentially no uh, TC suppression. <clears throat> and then uh, what Anton Voronsov can do is to, uh, is to uh, the, do the following. Uh, we can infer what the specularity is uh, for these two cases. And uh, we can see if the gap suppression, so this is the gap under these different conditions as a function of temperature, um, uh, specular and diffuse. Um, if the uh, measurements of the gap are consistent with the theoretical values of the gap, uh, with those boundary conditions and we find internal uh, consistency. So you have a self-consistent descrip description by quasi-classical theory of both TC suppression and gap suppression with specularity as the uh, adjustable parameter. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, you look at this data here, we have uh, a solid helium-3 boundary layer then we have uh, a TC suppression, which is stronger than uh, what we get for, for diffuse scattering. <clears throat> and what this does then is, uh, uh, with Anton, uh, then we examine various forms of, uh, of magnetic scattering from the surface helium-3 boundary layer, which is magnetic. And we found that the only process, or he found that the only process uh, that will give rise <clears throat> to, to this effect of stronger TC suppression is a spin flip scattering. So it's a kind of condo like uh, exchange term between the spin of the incoming uh, quasi particle 
and the spins on the uh, helium-3 spins on the surface boundary layer of the, uh, of the cavity. Um, so, um, what the previous data shows then is that we should be able to, uh, to shrink uh, the, uh, if, we, if we have specular boundaries, to arbitrarily uh, shrink the height of the cavity um, and still retain uh, no suppression of TC or of the gap. Um, so, let's do that. Um, so, what we are interested to to do then is to shrink the cavity uh, below 100 nanometers. And uh, why do we want to do that? Um, we want to do that because uh, there's going to be new physics that comes from size quantization in the normal state because under high degrees of confinement in the Z direction, the spherical Fermi surface will be broken up into Fermi disks because of size quantization along the Z, Z direction. There are potential quantum Hall analogs uh, there's the, you know, we can understand better the influence of, uh, of uh, pairing by spin fluctuations in the system because spin fluctuations in 2D are different from spin fluctuations in 3D. And we're also interested in um, the extent to which we can get generalizations of the KT uh, transition in a quasi two-dimensional system. Um, but we really ought to establish what the uh, um, we've, we know here that we, the A phase is stable. Does the A phase continue to be stable as we shrink the height of the cavity uh, below 100 nanometers? So uh, the following experiment on an 80 nanometer cavity uh, demonstrates that this is the case. Um, and so uh, the upshot of that then is that thin films of a PX plus IPY superfluid are experimentally uh, accessible. Um, and that's an interesting um, place to be because, um, as you know, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the uh, superconductivity community to establish unconventional superconductors with all the parameters that's PX plus IPY. And for a very long time, um, strontium ruthenate was identified as such a superconductor. And now that identification has been um, thrown into some into, into some question. Um, so the new behaviors that uh, would arise um, from thin films of unconventional superconductors is a very interesting, uh, interesting subject. Um, and that's something that we can pursue uh, in our system, the superfluid helium-3. Um, so, um, so here we're down uh, at uh, 18 nanometers. Um, the specularity that describes this dashed curve, you see there's a tiny bit of TC suppression. Um, so the analysis says that the specularity is not actually precisely one, but it's 0 point, uh, 0 0.98. Um, so, so far, we haven't done an experiment um, with um, helium, or haven't done experiments with a surface boundary layer of helium-3. Uh, and then this is old torsional oscillator study. Um, and the nature of this experiment was that naturally there was a solid helium-3 surface boundary layer. And that found an apparent change in phase uh, between 138 nanometers and 100, around 138 nan nanometers. Um, which su suggests that as you thin um, uh, superfluid helium-3 film with a solid helium-3 surface boundary layer uh, through this kind of thickness, there's a change in the order parameter. Um, so it will be very interesting to um, do an NMR experiment which establish that, and that's something that we're working on. Um, and uh, why is that interesting? Because uh, it will address the question, does magnetic surface scattering, which we've argued is present in this case, does magnetic surface scattering influence the equilibrium order parameter? So we can do that in a hopefully clean way in this, in this system. Um, so now I'd like to move on to uh, spatially uh, modulated uh, superfluids. 
Um, so now we're interested in, uh, this is the B phase order parameters, the all three components of the spin triplet. <clears throat> and uh, here it is under confinement. And uh, this is the order parameter written in, in matrix form. Uh, and here you see that there is um, a, um, a reversal in the sign of uh, this component of, of, the, uh, of the order parameter across a domain wall. <clears throat> uh, and uh, within, the, uh, within the domain wall, um, the, the order parameter this is roughly speaking planar phase. That's a, a very rough statement, but what, one one here with this term here vanishing is, is, is the planar phase. Um, and uh, th these um, uh, topological, um, sorry, these domain walls between um, uh, that the might exist in superphelium three were first characterized by Salomon and Bolovic in the in the eighties. But what Baranzov and Sauls demonstrated was that under confinement, uh, these domain walls can be destabilized. <clears throat> um, and roughly speaking, uh, the origin of that stabilization is that uh, the presence of this domain wall, you see there's a, a phase change in the order parameter crossing the domain wall. Uh, so uh, the phase change crossing the domain wall compensates for the phase change uh, from, the, from, the, from the scattering event. <clears throat> and uh, th this leads to the stability of, the, uh, of such, a, such a domain wall, roughly speaking. Actually, yeah. if I can just interject, uh, we're sort of slowly coming to the end of the speaker time and moving into question time. Uh, so you can judge as, for yourself as to how you want to divide between taking questions and uh, finishing off the talk. Okay. Um, 15 minutes, uh, last maybe a couple of minutes uh, because we started a little bit after the time. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, so what was predicted was a stripe phase then in which uh, the sign of one component of the order parameter alternates as you cross these domain walls. Um, and um, this is the weak coupling uh, prediction, these, uh, this region here with horizontal pur purple lines then uh, is, the, is, the, is the predicted region for uh, the stability of the, of, of the, uh, of the stripe phase. Um, and um, it's found then that if you introduce strong coupling effects, then that strongly modifies the region of stability of the of the strike phase. So strong coupling is is uh, means that um, the formation of the superfluid state has a back action on the on on the pairing on the pairing mechanism. Um, so then that's dealt with by uh, uh, a generalized ginsburg landau free energy expansion with strong coupling parameters, which are all in principle experimentally determined. Um, so basically uh, what we do is NMR, I, because of the time I clearly don't have time to go into details, um, but there are various averages of the order parameter. We know that the, uh, com these components of the order parameter are spatially dependent uh, both across the cavity, uh, but in the stripe phase, they may also vary in the plane, plane of the cavity. And uh, uh, the point is, by NMR, we can measure these th these averages. Um, so this is clearly quite an obvious and, uh, and pretty result. Uh, that for the uniform B phase, uh, this uh, small Q bar parameter is equal to this large Q bar parameter and is given by this ratio. But if uh, the sign of delta perp is oscillating within with 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 position, uh, then uh, Q bar is going to be uh, is going to be zero. Uh, so there's a strong difference between uh, the value of Q bar in the stripe phase and the uniform phase, and we can measure that Q bar by uh, NMR. And I can't explain because I haven't got time, uh, but trust me that we can do that. Uh, and these are the measurements. <clears throat> and what the measurements show is that uh, th these averages deviate from the uh, expected value for the uniform B phase, but they're not consistent with the values for the stripe phase. 
Um, but they are consistent uh, with a, a, a two-dimensional rather than a one-dimensional spatial modulation. Um, and this is something that uh, uh, Lev, the first author on this paper, coined uh, the polka dot phase. Or you could otherwise describe it as a two-dimensional uh, spatially modulated phase. Um, so interestingly, going and looking at the literature, uh, there's plenty of discussion about spatially modulated superconductors and plenty of systems in which uh, attempts have been made to uh, measure such a state. <clears throat> and uh, in that case, also two-dimensional as well as one-dimensional structures have been um, posited. Uh, but the point I want to make is I think we have pretty clear evidence uh, of the existence of such a spatially modulated superfluid um, to compare with these uh, attempts in superconductors. <clears throat> um, the, the question then is, uh, what was predicted was a one-dimensional stripe phase and what we've observed is a two-dimensional um, um, polka, dot, polka dot phase. Uh, why is that? Um, uh, is the 2D phase um, energetically favored or is it uh, metastable? And I mention this because uh, uh, Kawakami and Mr. Shimura have come up with a really interesting idea um, that you actually need to be a little bit more careful about how you deal with the generalized order parameter as you go through the domain wall and consider more components. Uh, these are the components that were consist uh, considered by Wyman and Sauls and some other components that may spatially vary as you go through the domain wall have been considered. And they have to do with, a, as it were, a, a polar phase contribution to, uh, to, to, to the order parameter. Um, and what these authors have shown is, is that the topology of the polar component uh, is different through stripes and uh, the polka dot, polka dot phase. So the domain wall configuration has different spatial topologies. Uh, so that may give rise to a topological stability of a 2D spatially modulated phase, which means that we might see it even if it isn't the equilibrium phase. <clears throat> It also gives uh, the possibility of creating uh, such faces by kibble Zurich type quench mechanism. Um, so um, I'm close to the end. I just got a couple more slides here on, on the superfluid helium. Um, so uh, just a few, if you give me just a few more minutes, Gunnar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's up to you. I mean, I always yeah. a good time to take some questions on the no, I, I, I'm not trying to avoid questions. I'm just trying to get, reach uh, a natural conclusion. Um, so, um, so what's our current our, our current direction? Our current direction is is hybrid structures. Uh, the idea is that uh, confinement is uh, a control parameter that can determine what the equilibrium material phase is, and so uh, and these material phases are quite distinct uh, P-wave superfluid phases or even under strong confinement uh, normal, normal phase. Um, so we can use then uh, structured confinement um, then uh, to interface interfaces, for example, an SNS in, uh, structure or an NSN structure, and then study uh, these interfaces by measuring transport through these hybrid structures. Or we can create uh, more complicated order, or, or order parameters uh, by construction, by creating an array of posts or channels or, um, or, or, uh, or, or islands. I mean, this may even be characterized as a P-wave superfluid uh, metamaterial. So, so in other words, it's about using uh, different uh, predicted phases under different structures. So for example, B-square is, uh, is, is a sort of a version of the, of the B-phase in which a continuous uh, fourfold uh, continuous rotational symmetry is broken uh, by the fourfold symmetry of this uh, of this post structure. <clears throat> so you have a rich order parameter, but you can use the uh, the, um, the the structure of the of the confining space in in, in, in which the superfluid is placed to sculpture the order parameter into different into different phases, and then uh, create different hybrid structures uh, from the, from, from this. Um, so we have a bunch of experimental challenges going forward, um, mostly around uh, the detection and characterization of surface and edge excitations in, in, in this material. 
Um, and then I wanted to, uh, 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 I had some supplementary slides on uh, stuff that we were doing on cooling two decks and stuff that we were doing on uh, ytterbium rhodium two silicon two. Uh, and now this is the picture of the people who are contributing to this work at Wall Holloway. And that's uh, a nice point at which to stop. So I'm sorry I went over by about eight minutes or so. Well, don't worry, that was, that's fine. You had a few questions in the meeting. So let's thank uh, John for a great talk to start with. Um, okay, so does anybody have some questions to uh, put forward? Otherwise, I can uh, go ahead. Um, right, so, so then maybe let me uh, go with one on the um, domain walls, or rather the uh, subgap states, right? So there's this prediction that um, whenever you have vortices or domain walls, uh, that you get these linearly dispersing uh, modes. Is there some experimental signature that you can actually directly access uh, uh, to show them spectrally? Um, so um we have two phases um let me see go back here um so um the uh the, the presence of uh, uh, of these excitations manifest in different ways in the in the two phases so uh the B phase uh, with um, uh, specular boundaries has this uh, uh, Majorana-like uh, cone of linear dispersing excitations in, in, in the mega. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that there are ground state uh, spin currents on the surface of the B phase. Um, there's been some success actually <coughs> in um, in the ALTA group um, in um, trying to detect um, those um, spin currents at the free surface of superfluid super helium-3 by coupling something that's called a Magnon BEC to the, to, to the, to the free surface. Um, the, um, uh, the A phase with the specular surface, as we discussed, um, there are no surface excitations, but what remain are edge, edge uh, excitations um, and so uh, they will contribute uh, to the thermal conductivity in a, in a quantized uh, way um, depending on the number of um, effectively uh, the, the, the C number or the number of um, effectively Fermi discs in the combined in the, in the confined structure um, and the, the, the difficulty there is um, <clears throat> to separate the contribution from those edge states uh, from uh, the, uh, the bulk, as it were, of the confined um, uh, sub, sub, superfluid. Um, and an impediment there is actually very little is known uh, about the thermal conductivity under, under confinement. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, so what, do you think you'd actually measure that? I mean, is it easy to, um, in that regime of very thin samples, still measure yes. thermal? Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so some work has been going on. We've been collaborating with the group uh, at Chivat Papi's group in Cornell, um, and they've already done some measurements of the thermal conductivity under um, uh, um, one, one micron uh, confinement. And uh, we're working on uh, methodologies to extend uh, those measurements to, uh, to, to, to thinner films. Um, there's also um, some interesting uh, predictions by um, recently published in PRL um, by uh, Jim Sauls and a co-worker um, whose surname I can't pronounce, but first name is Wave. Um, uh, uh, that has to, that has to, huh? corn, I think. Thank you very much, Gunnar. I think I, uh, uh, right, uh, So um, that has to do with um, uh, skew scattering uh, uh, in a uh, in in a chiral uh, superconductor that gives rise to a whole uh, thermal thermal conductivity. Um, so th that's more of a um, evidence for the uh, 
the chirality of the um, order parameter, which of course is something of interest in um, superconductors where it's very difficult to determine what the nature of the order parameter uh, is. And it's a relative of the thermal Hall effect, um, but something that's significantly easier uh, to, to measure. Um, but one of the things that we're um, thinking about and haven't quite pinned down, but let me tell you about it since you asked, is um, imagine you have a structure like this. <clears throat> um, then um, at the uh, SN, SN boundary, um, you'll, you'll have Andrea bound states uh within this within this n region and you'll also have surface excitations on this very clean interface between s and n uh, so you have a completely disorder uh, free interface i think of this as the as a sort of the simply helium 3 equivalent of the semiconductor pn junction you know the problem of interfaces in making transistors was the uh what was the, uh, the 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 deal breaker until they came up with the idea of, well, let's just let's take a single piece of material and vary the doping as we vary the material and produce a, a very clean interface. <clears throat> uh, so here we're using confinement then to produce a very, very clean interface. Uh, now you could ask the question, um, uh, let's measure the thermal connectivity between, uh, b b between, here, at, b between here and here. Um, and, um, we also have a, a great degree of freedom because uh, we can adjust um, we can adjust the the, the length of, the, uh, of this region. Um, the, um, um, the the quasi particle mean free path in uh, in helium three is huge actually uh, at zero pressure at sixty microns at the uh, um, so so that's not a barrier so. Uh, it, we can have you know many many coherence length. Uh, um, uh, long uh, junctions, as it were. So it's an SNS sort of bridge uh, bridge structure. And now probably what you've got to do, uh, actually, is to measure the thermal conductivity as a function of the phase difference uh, between uh, these two uh, superconductors. So um, that will probably uh, require putting this thing into a rotating cryostat. Uh, but uh, that's okay, because uh, we've got good friends in Alto uh, in the European microcovering platform uh, with a rotating cryostat. Um, and in fact, there is a uh, there was a recent uh, 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 um, uh, paper, I believe, on thermal transport in uh, P-wave superconductors in, in in such a in, in such a in such a structure. So for me, actually. Um, uh, these uh, the, these clean interfaces within the superfluid are, are, are maybe a, a great example, um, but um, the, uh, there's a there's a bunch of stuff that uh, is going on in the uh, in, in the um, thermal conductivity um, experiments that have been done so, so far, which really isn't understood. So I don't think we understand um, how the surface excitations actually um, couple to the bulk. Um, helium-3 uh, quasi-particles and lots of things like that. Like that. So I think if, if we go into a new regime, then something interesting is bound to emerge. Very good. Do we have one more question uh, that just popped up in the chat? Uh, Srijish, do you want to ask a question yourself and just unmute, unmute yourself? Or... Um, sure. Uh, thank you. Like, uh, I was thinking about this uh, retroreflective scattering that you were talking yeah. about. So I was thinking along the lines of the familiar basic uh, laws of reflection and this thing doesn't seem to satisfy that it's and how can we have that happening on a surface okay so um so jim souls um uh, who first pr uh, pr 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 proposed this i think he's analog analog he's a great cyclist uh so it's however you make those reflector things on bi on bicycles it's a uh, kind of like a serrated um, surface. I think you'd have to profile the surface in some interesting way, like a bicycle reflector. That reminds me, I need to go and look up how those things were actually designed, but something like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Excellent. And uh, I'm not sure why we why would we want to do that because um, it, 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 it's there for completeness as a, a, as an example of um, a maximally uh, pair breaking surface, right? Um, so uh, I'm not sure uh, it will be interesting to engineer that, but I'm not sure what the utility of it uh, would be. So it was put in there for sort of completeness, as it were. That was the logic behind it, for what it's worth. Thank you. You're welcome. John, can I ask a question returning to the spin liquid uh, issue? Um, yeah. You, you have a you have a divergence in these uh, in 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 the effective mass uh, that you've observed. And no. No, we haven't. We. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I say no. Yeah, sorry. I, sorry, I interrupt you. Sorry, I thought you had a, the a, a divergence in the effective mass as you approach the putative transition to the spin liquid, and that your main that is your main criteria for it being a, a spin liquid. I was wondering. No. I was wondering whether you could independently perhaps measure the mobility of the helium atoms, for example, from using torque. Uh, measuring the torque response at finite finite frequency rather than zero frequency or in the time domain. Just a question. Um, possible. So here you have the mass diverging in in the plot you've you've sh you've shown us here. Um, uh, but how can you rule, not rule out, for example, some other kind of hidden order beyond the transition uh, in a mobile? metallic state rather than a state. Well, so, um, so in this, it, 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 there's a lot of action. Let's take the uh, helium-3 on helium-4 on graphite. So that's uh, this mass divergence region here. Um, so we're talking about action in this layer. So what have we done on, on, on this layer? Um, so uh, we have the isotope helium-4. So if we, if we replace uh, the helium-3 by the helium-4, as you know, Piers, then in this, in this region around here, uh, um, uh, we find um, super solid uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, then if we take that uh, two-dimensional helium-4 super solid and uh, we remove, as it were, some uh, helium-4 atoms and dope it with, uh, with, with, with helium-3. Um, we, we've, uh, we, we then measure the, um, the, the magnetization association of a, a, di a dilute solution of helium-3 in, in helium-4. And it has, uh, most, it has a lot of characteristics of um, localized, um, localized solid. I mean, it's not a straightforward localized solid because it's quantum solid. So um, helium-3 impurity <clears throat> can tunnel around uh, through the helium-4 uh, uh, matrix as a as a delocalized as a delocalized uh, de quasi-particle. So that's helium-3 in helium-4. Uh, and then at low temperatures, you get stuff that's got to do with strain-strain interactions, which localize the uh, the, the helium-3. Um, uh, but there's lots of other studies in, in, in this region here, which strongly uh, support um, the, the, the notion um, that, that this thing that I'm describing as a putative quantum spin liquid is, is indeed a solid. Uh, but there's another uh, approach to answering your question, which is over here, you see, we have this mass divergence when instead we have a bilayer of <clears throat> HD as this. Mm -hmm. uh, pre-plating pre pre layer um, and uh, and then what we find actually uh, it, 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 uh, at, at, at these densities is that the high temperature behavior is curie weiss law um, quite clearly uh, with uh, very significant values of the uh, of the weiss constant so the maximum value of the weiss temperature is about 10 millikelvin. Um, uh, it's at lower density, so that's um, 
something that's understandable. The exchange will be higher because the density is is lower. The um, uh, uh, the, the the exchange motion uh, tends to go um, because of the way that the overlap of the wave functions that's responsible for that um, uh, is uh, tends to go up as you go to lower lower density. Um, so this is another system uh, to, uh, to to consider. Okay, thank you very so much. We, yeah. So I think in this space we have enough parameters that we can help hopefully pin it down. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you, and I think it's time to uh, close that uh, first talk and thank John again for uh, an excellent presentation and also for making contact to uh, the work that we just heard about last week from Senthil regarding spin liquid. So it's great to see that actually there's a potential other realization out there in 2D helium films. So thanks very much, John, and let's put our hands together for him once more. Pleasure. Right, so we have a uh, time for a short break, and then we will be back in just uh, a couple of minutes at uh, 3 p.m. UK time with uh, Miles' talk. Gunnar, is there any point in doing the breakout rooms, or should we just leave it as it is? I think uh, on the days with the triple act, we had sort of given up on the breakout rooms anyway, right? Okay, very good. Okay. So, but unless, I mean, if you want, we can start a bit later. I mean, uh, no, 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 that's fine. If we skip to the keep to the schedule, I think we should just uh, stick on the main session and people can just very good chatter a bit if they want to. Okay.